Uh, good evening, and welcome to the Center for the Study of World Religions. My name is Charles Stang, and I'm the director here, and I'm very happy to welcome you for um, the annual Albert and Vera List Lecture in Jewish Studies. I'm especially delighted and proud to introduce this evening's speaker, Professor Hera, Sarah, Hera, <laughs> Sarah <laughs> Hammerschlag from the University of Chicago, who also happens to be a very dear friend of mine. Recent list lecturers include Guy Strimsa, who in fact mentioned you in his lecture, so in, you were here last year in spirit, Stephen Kepnes, who joins us to my right, and Joel Kaminsky. Before I give Professor Hammerschlag a proper introduction, I would like to thank the Center for Jewish Studies for their co-sponsorship of this annual lecture series. And I'd like to thank the Center staff, especially Corey O'Brien, the Associate Director, and Ariella Ruth Goldberg. I don't know where Ariella Ruth is. There she is in the back. Thank you, Ariella Ruth. She is the, event, the Center's Events Coordinator and it is she who makes visits such as these run so smoothly. So thank you both for your support. I'm not one for long introductions, so I'm going to make this brief so that we can spend our time with Sarah. Sarah Hammerschlag is Associate Professor of Religion and Literature at the University of Chicago. She is an expert on Judaism in the post-World War II intellectual scene in France focusing on such figures as Emmanuel Levinas and Jacques Derrida, among others. She is the author of two books in 2010, The Figural Jew, Politics and Identity in Post-War French Thought, and in 2016, Broken Tablets, Levinas, Derrida, and the Literary Afterlife of Religion. Now, we'll be hosting a special seminar on broken tablets tomorrow from 12 to 2 here at the center in the conference room. Um, and there are still a few spots available. If any of you are interested, I would ask that you speak to Ariella Ruth at the end of this evening for more details. And this evening's lecture, so I understand, emerges from Sarah's third book project entitled Sowers and Sages the Renaissance of Judaism in post-war Paris. After her lecture, there will be time for questions and perhaps for more refreshments and mingling. But we will need to whisk her off for dinner at some point. So please don't take offense if I literally pull her away <laughs> from conversation with you. So please join me in welcoming Professor Sarah Hammerschlag for her lecture entitled Truth for Children, Suffering and Election in Post-War French-Jewish Thought. Lower the microphone. Thank you, Charlie, for that introduction and for the invitation. It's such a pleasure to be here and see so many faces that I know, so many people that I've had wonderful good fortune to meet in other contexts. Um, and thank you to Arielle Ruth for helping with all the details of this uh, evening. So Charlie gave you the title of my talk. I have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm afraid it's a little bit crude as these things go, but it has some images will, which I hope will help you keep track of all the cast of characters in the story. It has quite a cast of characters. The phrase truth for children is from a radio address that Emmanuel Levinas gave in September of 1945 only a few months after his return from captivity in May of that year. In this talk, the philosopher describes his time as a prisoner of war in a German camp set aside for Jews. Because of the Geneva Conventions, these prisoners were protected from the worst of the atrocities perpetrated by the Germans on the Jewish people. But they lived in what Levinas describes as a state of suspense. Death hung over them like a familiar shadow, but each day deferred. According to Levinas, it was a time for many in the camp of Jewish awakening. I'm quoting from him here. The Jew lent his own significance to the sadness that he shared with his non-Jewish comrades, a consciousness of Judaism acute as a spasm. Within this context, the biblical accounts of the Jewish people took on a new significance. The stories of the patriarchs, of, gods, of God and Pharaoh, regained, he writes, quote unquote, after so many detours, their literal meaning. They became true, quote again, in their elementary truth, 
in their truth for children, in their vulgar truth. It's of course nothing new or revelatory to suggest that scripture has served a crucial function for communities in crisis, nor is it anything new for Jews to ritually consider the biblical text to be speaking about them or to reimagine themselves into its circumstances. The very liturgy of the Passover Haggadah asks the community to re-experience the exodus out of Egypt each Pesach. Nonetheless, there's something striking in Levinas' description of the significance these stories held for him and for the other J Jewish inmates of the camp, something we can locate in the language he uses here. Levinas claims biblical literalism while at the same time calling this a truth for children, a vulgar truth. How can he both identify with this truth and judge it as simplistic? In my research for my current book project, which I'll sketch out in a moment, I've discovered this return to literalism to be a broader phenomenon among French Jews during the war. And I'll argue that it has far-reaching consequences for post-war French Judaism. What I want to think about today is the impact of this Jewish literalism on a generation of French Jews who survived the war and then struggled in ways unique to this community with how to understand and conceive of themselves both in relationship to the French state and to the state of Israel. So first, let me back up and talk a little bit about French Judaism before and after the war. And then we can hone in on the issues and questions that I've just briefly sketched out. The Yiddish proverb, Leben wie Gott in Frankreich, to live like God in France, sums up the general perception of life for French Jews among the Eastern European diaspora until the Second World War. The first among nations to emancipate its Jews, France was widely seen in the 19th century as a kind of utopia for les Israelites, which is a sort of term that signifies the kind of confessional way in which Judaism was understood. So to say les Juifs was in fact derogatory. Unlike in Germany, where Jewish rights were alternately proffered and rescinded throughout the 19th century, stabilizing finally only with Germany's unification under the leadership of Bismarck, in France, citizenship arrived almost coincident with the revolution. While neither Jews nor Protestants were originally understood to be included under the Declaration of the Rights of Man, final equality under the law did come about through excuse me, protracted debate. And by 1791, all Jews in France were granted citizenship with the explicit contention that French citizenship replaced the corporate membership of Jews in their kehilot, their religious communities. The success of Jewish assimilation was premised on the idea that when granted the means and the rights to participate in the life of the nation, Jews would gladly sacrifice the forms of life that had kept them set apart from their countrymen. While Judaism didn't disappear in France, as both the early reformers and Napoleon had in fact hoped, the identification it produced among French Jews with their fatherland was really quite profound. By the centenary of the revolution, French Jews had come to see France itself as the inheritor of the Mosaic legacy. It was in France that the first international Jewish aid organization was started, the Alliance Israelite Universelle, with the express mission of spreading French values to Jewish people across the Mediterranean basin, right? So that's what the first Jewish organization did. It spread French values to Jews. As it stated in its mission statement, if you believe that the influence of the principles of 89, 1789 are all, are all powerful in the world, that, is the ex that the example of peoples who enjoy absolute religious equality is a force, then Israelite of the entire world, come give us your membership, your cooperation. So identification with the state of France was indeed understood by the organization as the viable means of expressing one's commitment to Judaism. OK, so that's our starting point. <laughs> For some prominent Jews, the civilizing mission itself became the primary means of expressing their Judaism. For others, there was also the matter of reforming the Jewish tradition to make it align with Republican values. The latter was something of a prerequisite for its continued existence. Under the consistory system put in place under Napoleon's regime, French Jews were constituted to parallel the other two dominant religious, French religious traditions, the Protestant and Catholic churches. And that's where you get this term, les Israelites. It was thus defined strictly in confessional terms, and perhaps more importantly, universalist terms, and I emphasize that, such that its fundamental teachings were understood not only to be consonant with French universalism, but foundational or fundamental to it. 
efforts to identify Judaism with the Republic were so successful that La Croix, the leading Catholic newspaper in 1889, referred to the centenary of the revolution as the Semitic centenary. <coughs> Edouard Drummond's vituperative and wildly popular La France Juive, published in 1896, argued that the Jews were the true beneficiary of the revolution and were simultaneously responsible for the corrosion of the values of the nation. So that identification also became a source for anti-Semitism. So the period between the centenary and World War II was marked both by the national crisis of the Dreyfus Affair, which brought the Jewish question to the fore, and by the influx of Jews from the East streaming into Paris, first to escape the pogroms and then the Nazis. While the birth of Zionism is often credited to Herzl's realization during the Dreyfus Affair that assimilation was a failure, and a few French Zionists did emerge from it, the dominant strand of French Judaism was deeply unsympathetic to Zionism, to its cause, seeing it as antithetical to its mission. Where French Jews sought to define Judaism in religious terms, the dominant strand of Zionists reclaimed Judaism as a form of nationalism. French Jewish scholars and activists tended to see the Dreyfus Affair as a battle to protect the ideals of French humanism. The Zionists, at least implicitly in shaping their own ethnocentric politics, acknowledged and legitimated the arguments of the very ethnic separatists against which the Dreyfusards fought so avidly. I'm quoting now from a 1907 article, but the spirit of Judaism, as it is reflected in its history, is the condemnation of Zionism. This is from uh, the review Universe Israelite in 1907, um, to give you a sense of what the sort of the, the standard reaction of the Jewish community was to Zionism at that time. But as the demographics of the community shifted, so did its politics. The Jewish population in France increased by about a third by 1914 and doubled by 1939. These new immigrants brought with them a myriad of Jewish sensibilities from Hasidism to Bundist and Zionist perspectives. In the short run, the Ostjuden, in their poverty and with their distinctive dress, were often viewed as a dangerous spectacle, a provocation to anti-Semitism. In the long run, this community did much to change the standing of Zionism in France. The most profound shift on this issue, however, for the French Jewish community occurred during the war. Even the Alliance Israelite Universelle, which had been staunchly against Zionism, reversed its position after the war, and on November 11, 1945, announced its unmitigated commitment to the settlement of Jews in Palestine, not only as a practical solution to a humanist crisis of epic proportion, but as a spiritual remedy for a people in need of rejuvenation, calling it, quote, the supreme hope of those who wish out of their distress for rebirth. Given the circumstances, of course, this reversal is not in itself surprising. And it was mirrored to some extent in the United States as well. But what's noteworthy about the French case is the consistency with which the argument for Zionism was made in religious terms. Having defined Judaism as a confession in its pre-war context, Zionism also had to be justified in confessional terms. Thus, throughout the 1950s, French Jewish journals consistently lamented what they saw as a lack of religious emphasis in the burgeoning state. Some actually justified the role of the diaspora as safeguarding for Judaism its religious soul. Others were struggling to make their tradition cohere with the Zionist project. This required a radical rethinking of many things, not the least of which was how to read Jewish scripture. So the shift I want to track thus pivots around this issue of biblical interpretation. French Jewish biblical scholarship had in its first iteration in the second half of the 19th century, not surprisingly probably given everything you've heard already, it had been primarily concerned with reading the Mosaic Covenant and the books of the prophets as forerunners of French Republican values. So for Joseph Salvador, for example, the author of what's been translated as Paris, Rome, Jerusalem in 1860, the importance of the Mosaic Covenant is as the exemplary social contract. That's that's the important function that, that essentially the, the Jewish past should play. The importance of the people Israel is not in the people itself for Salvador, but in their embodiment of a concept of a people that is covenantal rather than ethnic. For James d'Armes de Terre, the book of the prophets was Judaism's great gift to the world. Judaism's new role was as a guide to French Catholicism. Judaism continued to exist, he argued, so that it could invest modernity with prophetic values. Literally, they were a remnant that could teach Catholics how to turn back to the books of the prophets and to make that the core of their faith. 
In contrast, in the post-war context, in the writings of André Neher, Leon Ashkenazi, and others, not only was there a new emphasis on differentiating the Jewish canon from the philosophical tradition of the West, but also a new emphasis on the Hebrew Bible as a text about the Jewish people, for the Jewish people, as a text that not only narrates the Jewish past, but also its future. This doesn't mean, however, that these thinkers gave up on universalism. But as we'll see in a bit, they reconstituted it as a concept born out of Jewish election and Jewish exemplarity. The shift was compounded by the fact that French Jews saw themselves as having a unique role to play in the post-war context, as the only Jewish community on the continent that had survived relatively intact. Jews in France fared better in World War II than in almost any other nation occupied by the Nazis. About 75,000 of France's 300,000 were sent to concentration camps. The rest survived through various means, but prim primarily through a highly effective underground network throughout the south of France. Nonetheless, during and after the war, Jews in France had to come to terms with the fact that it was not the Nazis that had first instituted race laws against them, but their own government. For a community that had largely come to see its tradition as exemplary within the French Republic, as the embodiment of, the Fr of France's universalist and republican values, the stripping away of its French identity constituted a profound trauma. For many, the myth of French greatness and the role of its Jews as its greatest ambassadors it had to be replaced. Identification with the history of Jewish suffering through their own wartime experiences became the very means thus by which this generation forged a new identity. Of course, I should point out that this wasn't true for all French Jews. In fact, in the years between 1947 and 1950, 5% of Jews changed their names. Well, that doesn't sound like that much. It's six times higher than the period between 1808 and 1939. But those who did return to the fold were a diverse group. Some had never identified as Jewish before the war. For others, observance had been a consistent feature of their French identity, but without much depth to it and without seeing any conflict between their Jewish and French identities. So the, but the group I follow in my book are defined by their convergence from all these different directions as contributors to the colloque des intellectuels juifs de l'enfant says. So this was one of the most successful intellectual projects to arise in the context of post-war French Judaism. The colloque met for the first time in 1957 and included well-known poets, philosophers, psychoanalysts, some old, some young, some who had a background in Judaism before the war, some who had very little. Its three most significant and long-standing contributors, to whom I'll return at the end of my talk, were Emmanuel Levinas, André Neher, and Leon Ashkenazi. Though Levinas is widely known in this country, as is Neher among some circles, Ashkenazi's following is largely in France and Israel, but you shouldn't underestimate it, it's, it's quite impressive. Together they made up the core of the colloque for its first decade. At the colloque's first meeting in 1957, the philosopher Vladimir Jankalevich, who was himself one of these kind of figures who had hardly identified as a Jew, he was enamored of Christian mysticism. Um, He'd himself given up really on Judaism before the war. He stood up and said in 1957, in a certain sense, Hitler could be called a benefactor to the Jewish people. He permitted a good number of us to develop a sense of our Judaism. As unsettling as Shankalevich's statement may be, among the figures who were part of the post-war movement, it was a sentiment in fact often echoed as the recognition of their Judaism involved a measure of gratitude. A newfound Jewish consciousness met, led many young intellectuals to a cultural awakening, to the reading of biblical and rabbinic sources, and to a renewed interest in traditional practice. The colloque was initiated as a means of organizing these impulses, but doing so would involve the rethinking of what it meant to be a Jewish intellectual in France. André de Herre put it this way in 1963, when he prefaced the publication of the minutes of the colloque's first meeting. For a long time, the intellectual Jew was a figure for the lost child of Judaism. In every arena, he was at his task on all the fields of battle. He struggled in all the most worthwhile and perilous fights. He made up the avant-garde, and these were the arenas, the risks, the battles. These were the most diverse of human responsibilities in which he was engaged, except for one, that precisely of Judaism. Even for those pre-war intellectuals, such as Joseph Salvador and the Grand Rabbi Zadak Khan, for whom Judaism was explicitly a matter of concern, their project was consistently one of arguing for the symmetry between Judaism's values and those of the French Republic. 
But for Nehair, in contrast, and his post-war colleagues, Levinas among them, the goal was fundamentally different. It was to make Judaism itself the arbiter of value. It's not surprising, of course, that Jewish text would be central to this dynamic, especially given the religious terms in which Judaism was broadly understood by the French Jewish establishment. It's perhaps also not surprising that wartime experience is the navel of this transformation. So let us return to the war as the site of transformation. I want to focus in on a couple more, besides the Levinas example, more crucial instances of transformation and to look at the role of biblical literalism in that transformation. Then in the last part of my talk, I'll shift forward to see how a similar logic marks the approach to Zionism in figures who emerged from this movement. It's difficult to underestimate the impact of the fall of France in 1940 on the nation, but in particular on its Jewish community. In the wartime journals, Levinas, in his wartime journals, Levinas describes the day after the surrender as a time of radical transformation, apocalyptic in their dimensions, but also as a moment of revelation when true reality showed itself for the first time. Here's a quote. There was no more France, he writes. It had departed in the night like an immense circus tent, leaving a clearing strewn with debris. For Levinas, this evacuation of the infrastructure of French culture and politesse occasioned the need to rethink the condition of ethics, which of course became his post-war project, but also the project to reclaim Judaism as a crucial cultural source for knowledge. In this later endeavor, he was not alone. While Levinas was in a camp, first in France and then in Germany, working in a forestry detail by day and conceptualizing this transformation in his journals at night, Another French Jewish soldier, Robert Gamzon, made the war an occasion for the concrete reorganization of Jewish lives. I have a picture of him, but I'm going to show it to you a little bit later. In the 1920s, as a teenager, Gamzon was initiated uh, as a, he initiated a Jewish branch of the Boy Scouts. He started the Jewish Boy Scouts in France, um, and they were called Les Eclaireurs Israelites de France. Initially, its mission, in line with Boy Scouts founder Baden Powell, was to rescue Jewish youth from the decadence of urban living. That is, in fact, what the Boy, Boy Scouts were initially about. In the case of the Jews, this was understood to be a double imperative. It was the task of the Scouts, Gamzon wrote, to fight against, I'm quoting, the sometimes mind-boggling physical and manual awkwardness of Jewish intellectuals whose hands know only how to make empty movements to support their words instead of using them to grasp hold of real tools. <laughs> At the war's beginnings, Gamzon found himself in a unique position as the leader of the Jewish Boy Scouts, a movement that was held in very high esteem by Pétain and his Vichy government for its emphasis on returning Jews to the land and to manual labor. He was thus deputized in 1940 by the Pétain government as the head of Jewish youth services for the Union Générale des Juifs de France. So essentially like the, the Jewish agency of the south of France, he was in charge of Jewish youth put in charge by Vichy. As a part of this project to retrain Jews to work the land, he had already developed an elaborate network of farm schools and was thus in this really unique position to help house and re-educate France's Jewish youth, many of whom had traveled to the southern free zone in the wake of the Nazi invasion. The movement itself is incredibly fascinating and I could talk about it endlessly, but had I more time, I'd go into its details. Suffice it to say that if Gamzon's initial motivation for organizing the Jewish scouts was to rejuvenate young Jews as hardy and capable men and women, the war itself quickly transformed that mission so that their primary task became that of turning men and women who had suddenly discovered that they did not count as French into Jews. So this is kind of, he, he was in this position of power because his aim, the aims of the Boy Scouts were very closely aligned with what Vichy wanted, but as it became clear to this whole group and as this influx of immigrants began to be their teachers, there's a kind of shift in the movement, not that they lose their interest in farming, but that begins to look more like something that can prepare you to go to Palestine than it does in something that's merely about rejuvenating the masculinity of Jewish males. Along with the mass exodus south, which physically displaced over 100,000 Jews in France, the instating of Vichy's 1940s race laws set adrift a generation of France's Jews, many of whom before the war had little or no consciousness of their Judaism. They lost their positions in universities, lycées, and government agencies, and newspapers, and perhaps even more importantly, they really lost their identities as French. Among them were also refugees from Germany and further east, which the scouts had begun taking in and housing already in the, in the late 1930s. 
Among the emigrants were a select few who brought with them a much richer Jewish education than their French counterparts. Some would, with time, become the movement's teachers. This confluence of learned immigrants and unoccupied French Jews, many of whom had never understood themselves, I'm sorry, many of whom had never understood themselves as French, I don't know what I mean there, began to emerge as a crucible <laughs> for transformation, and the war ironically became an opportunity in Gamzon's mind. For Gamzon, it literally began with a dream. November of 1940, Gamzon was visiting La Grasse, which I'm gonna show you a picture of, because I went and found it. Um, it's a farm in Lautrec in the Tarn region. Um, it's the, the first of the Jewish scout movement's newly established rural faculties, whose primary function of this house was to house displaced Jewish youth, many of whom had never lived outside the city. Um, so it was basically an abandoned farm. It looks very nice now. I think a nice family lives in it now. Um, and um, they took it over and they housed about 40 Jewish youth there and they had to learn how to farm on this farm. They had never known hard labor and were now working in the cold and the rain for 11 hours a day. On the night of the dream, Gamzon went to bed on a cot in the barn with the sound of rats scurrying across the beams. The following is the account he recorded in his journal. I just, I can never get enough of this dream. So, okay. <laughs> I was in a large building of red brick, like those inexpensive tall houses of the Parisian suburbs. It was not in Paris, but at the edge of a sea, in Marseille, no doubt. In front of the house where I was living, there were other brick houses like this one, and in front of them, the port. I was in a bedroom on a very high floor, and I felt terrible anguish. This anguish that one sometimes feels in dreams, in which I have felt also later in life. I saw an enormous wave rise out of the sea, a wave enormous and black with a white crest. It crashed over the lines of houses that were in front of ours, and they crumbled under the weight of the sea. I anxiously awaited the second wave, but it didn't come. Then I went down the stairs, and I noticed the walls were all cracked, and the house was damaged but still upright. At the bottom of the stairs was a little courtyard, and in this little courtyard there was a fountain covered in ice, like the fountain of La Grasse, and I have a picture of that fountain. The ice had split under the shock, and the water ran surprisingly clear, a water miraculously limpid and blue. And in the courtyard, there were chickens, which there were when I visited too, <laughs> like those on the farm, and they drank the water eagerly. And in my dream, I was surprised, and I said to myself, this is curious. I had not known that the chickens were so thirsty, and that the water was so pure. When I awoke, I was strangely confident in the future. The dream, as he remembered, it had the quality of a biblical parable or a prophetic visitation. Read in this light, it seems to suggest that the violence of the catastrophe would serve Gamzon and his scouts as the catalyst for life, for renewal even, as it leveled all around them. He and his flock would find the source itself, a fountain, frozen under the force of the wave's impact, the wave's impact having cracked its surface, giving his charges access for the first time to its nourishing powers. For Gamzon, this fountain was the source of a pure life, a Jewish life, but also one that literally welled up from the land. The spring's pure running water had been blocked by the deadening forces of modernity, the movement towards Jer Jewish urbanization and the pressures of assimilation. Ironically, thus, it was the grave threat of Nazi persecution that would break its frozen surface. From this point forward, Gamzon began quite literally to understand himself as the leader of a Jewish remnant, dressing, quote, all that are left in the house of Israel. Gamzon would preside over a group purified by the very forces that had destroyed so much of the larger community. As in the book of Isaiah for Gamzon and those around him, the fact of remaining entailed a mission. The work they set for themselves from 1940 forward was not merely the work of rescue, but of spiritual purification and rebuilding. It may seem difficult to contemplate that such a romantic vision could accompany such a dire political and social reality, yet it was not uncharacteristic of Gamzon nor his fellow scouts. In the recollections of other scout leaders, a number of whom wrote memoirs in the period, which are many of my sources, the war itself is recounted as something of a dream, a heightened reality in which a new way of living seemed possible, all of it animated by its particularly Jewish significance. Gamzon's dream is not an anomaly so much as a mythologized description of the reality that he and his fellow scouts found themselves living during these years. It's here that it shares its closest proximity to Levinas' account with which I opened. Levinas describes in his essay how Torah became a lens for understanding the prisoner's experience. How he, he describes how he came to see in the story of Abraham's walk with Isaac at Mount Moriah and to understand by it, his own capacity 
by his, I'm sorry, and to understand it, and to understand by it his own captivity as a test. I quote, it is, I think I have this on here. Yeah. It is by virtue of all these delays on the way that the test is fruitful. It is because of all that was bearable in the misery of the prisoner that this suffering could become a source of Jewish consciousness, a possible seed of a future Jewish life, Levinas writes. The stories of the biblical miracles themselves, of God's indefatigable love, were experienced both as a rebuke and then finally as a possibility. To implore God as a prisoner in the camps had its own mythic dimension. It wasn't merely to repeat the pleas of the patriarch, he suggests, and again, I quote, it was to feel God's presence in the burning of the suffering to distinguish the flame of the divine kiss. What is Judaism, he concludes, if not, if not the experience since Isaiah, since Job, of this possible return before hope at the depth of despair, of the pain in happiness, the discovery of the signs of election in suffering itself. In reading this essay of Levinas, it's become clear, it becomes clear that this conflation of suffering and election was more than an experience of recognition or even identification with the figures of Job or the suffering servant of Isaiah. Even as they were living through it, both the scouts and the Jewish prisoners that Levinas describes understood that they were living through an epic of biblical dimension. They understood that the contemporary moment had itself been rendered mythic. The sense in which this involved a kind of biblical literalism is for me nicely instantiated by the next slide. Okay, this is a Haggadah used by the residents of Lautrec, the farm I just showed you in 1941. As you can see, the illustrator has created a parallel between the slaves in Egypt and the farmer or the sower. Both have their attention directed towards what I assume is a symbol of the land with an image of wheat. Underneath the Egyptian is what appears to be a symbol of that from which he has escaped. We have to ask consequently, what is the symbol on the left? A smokestack? It's too early for it to have been an image of the crematorium, though it's uncanny. It must be a symbol of urban life of the factory, life separated from the land, but it's difficult not to read it as a reference to the camps. Either way, there's a sense that the young people on the farm perceive themselves not merely as identifying with the Egyptians, but of enduring a parallel trial of living through a moment whose drama was epic. The bottom of it. On the part of the scout movement, this was part of an explicit strategy to use the historic drama of the Jewish people as a means of cultivating Jewish identification. The poet, Jewish essayist, and scout leader Edmond Flegg hosted a seminar for Jewish youth at his home. All right, here's my picture. Okay, so here you have that, this Robert Gamzon, the um, one on the left, and that's Edmund Flegg on the right. Um, and he, so, so Flegg was officially the president of the scouts, though Gamzon was actually there, the person who started the movement. So Flegg had this um, vacation home, I guess, in Beauvillon, um, and he used it um, as a kind of retreat for the scouts in the early, year, early years of the war. And he hosted a seminar um, in which he um, had particularly targeted the Normelians and the Algragues, so like the, 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 the intellectual elite of Paris, the Jewish intellectual elite. And, so, and those were the people he wanted to make into the leaders of the Jewish community. Um, this is a quote from him. Those chic types so warm and deep and sincere, he wrote a friend, those who without Hitler would not have even known they were Jewish. Again, there's this kind of gratitude. Flegg chose as the theme of his seminar, the suffering of Israel. In it, he attempted to contextualize the current crisis within a larger narrative of Jewish persecution, thus making France's Jews themselves protagonists in the historical drama of Judaism. This narrative perspective not only offered young disenfranchised Jews an alternative sense of identity to the one that they'd lost by way of the statutes, it conferred on the events themselves that they were living through a transcendent meaning. For some young people who had never even considered themselves Jewish, this provided a transformative means to reclaim their own sense of value. For Flegg, the sense of identity had been and indeed could again be, quote, the defense of Israel culture, community, and what he called la mystique. These could provide a kind of refuge and protection. Under the grip of persecution, the group was taught to live their suffering as a privilege, as a point of access to a history and a tradition that separated them from their oppressors. Interestingly enough, it was often those youth 
who had identified most strongly with France and its traditions that were most open to this new reading of their experiences. It was often those who'd grown up trusting in French rationalism and, hum and humanist universalism who were most willing to take on this truth for children, and like Levinas, able to identify with it in and for its simplicity. Let me share one final story before moving on to the post-war context. It refers to what became known as the School of the Prophets. Once again, it involves an unlikely figure, the biblical scholar Georges Levite. Until 1938, he had been enrolled for a doctorate at the Sorbonne, studying Hebrew and, Arab and Arabic. He was trained there to treat the text of the Hebrew Bible as a philologist and a historian. According to his son, um, who became a government minister under Nicolas Sarkozy, when Levite's parents were deported to Auschwitz, he lost his faith in God. But at the end of 1943, when the network of children's homes had to be disbanded and the Jewish scout movement went underground, which is another chapter of all this, Levite nonetheless denounced his commitment to enact a form of cultural and spiritual warfare against the Germans. But, n I'm sorry, tens of thousands of French, this is a quote, are fighting arm in hand, are fighting arms in hand among them many Jews, but no one is engaged in spiritual existence, he is remembered by his compatriots to have said. Inspired by Yochanan ben Zakkai, Levite gathered a small crew of three companions to enact an existence as a spiritual remnant. After a night on a train and a two-hour walk, they ended up at Istor near Chaumarger, a small village in the south central France. He found an abandoned house and he set up shop. Among the four that he recruited was a Jewish anarchist and atheist, a young Israelite of many generations who had no Hebrew at all, and a Polish emigre with a traditionalist background. At Istor, they devoted their energy to reading and interpreting the Torah. Only Mika, the Polish emigre, had lived a traditional existence. The Israelite, Pierre V. Reynal, did not even know the Hebrew Aleph Bet. According to Mika's account, there was a kind of avid devotion to their practices. Like Ben Zakai, he wrote, they were combating their enemies by reappropriating the study of the law. A journal entry from Mika recounts how the four celebrated Shavuot. With the war raging around them, they stayed out in the fields all night studying and praying. Such a vigil was, of course, traditional, but Mika reported that under these circumstances, they felt, I quote, this quasi-certitude that the heavens would open and God would come down to us as he had on Mount Sinai. Now, remember, of course, that Levit has declared himself to have been an atheist. In the morning, when nothing had arrived, we said to ourselves that perhaps we had not been sufficiently prepared. It's hard to tell in reading these accounts when and where such a sentiment involves any tongue-in-cheek. After all, Levit himself was an avowed atheist, according to his son. How do we understand this quasi-certitude? It's difficult not to register, register here something like what comes across in Levinas's essay, I think, as well, an accompanying incredulity, perhaps that this is, in fact, what they are experiencing. This incredulity seems still to penetrate through the simple belief as a vestige of the scientific viewpoint showing beneath the service, surface. Alternatively, there's something of a conundrum in these accounts. Perhaps the identification with the Jewish experience supersedes here the claim to the supernatural. But at the same time, the sense of identification seems to require the claim to the supernatural. After the war, when the smoke had lifted, the question of what it meant to understand in religious terms the Nazi persecution of European Jews only became more complicated, particularly as the reality of six million dead made the very question of theodicy obscene. At the end of Levinas's essay, The Jewish Experience of the Soldier, he describes how time would come, quote, to tarnish this joy in the recovered literal sense, in the simple truth regained. Levinas himself would not continue to adhere to a hermeneutic of biblical literalism in his own work. Far from it. He would insist both on the necessity of reading Torah with rabbinical commentary and on penetrating its surface to access its philosophical meaning. However, for other French Jewish intellectuals, the idea of understanding themselves as a remnant remained enticing and the strategy of reclaiming the biblical canon as a Jewish text, and thus as a means of cultural resistance, would prove to be persuasive. As Colette Brunschwig put it in 1953, in the first issue of the French journal Targum, quote, it is the privilege of some of Europe's Occidental Jews, those of France in particular, to have felt pass over them the fire of apocalyptic hatred and to not have been consumed. They had survived to ask questions, she wrote, but questions that the civilization in which they had been trained as good Western citizens, trained to ask after cause and effect, could not answer. 
It is the confluence of experiencing themselves as a remnant and feeling that their civilization had failed them that led a group of young people to see the Jewish biblical and rabbinic canon as the necessary focal point, both of their identity and of their search for meaning and understanding. Among those who influenced this new way of reading were, uh, so is, sorry, okay. So among those who influenced this new way of reading was Jakob Gordon. Gordon was a Russian immigrant. He'd studied in Germany among Hermann Cohen's disciples before making his way to France as a refugee after the Nazi rise to power. He is at the center of so much. A revered scholar among those who knew him, he spent the last months of the war teaching at Levitz School, the school I just mentioned, the School of the Prophets, and then at the Ecole Gibert Bloch, which was a school that Robert Gamzon, the scout leader, started after the war. In the course of his teaching, he came into contact with a number of figures who would become influential in the post-war context, including Levinas, André Neher, and Leon Ashkenazi. Levinas would not claim him as an inspiration, though there's some reason to believe that he was to some extent. André Neher and Leon Ashkenazi would, to their death, claim him as their primary teacher. In all these contexts, he explicitly expounded a Judaism that tied suffering to election. One of his essays from a course he gave at the end of the war, which we have because it was transcribed by Levite, is on the topic of galut, or exile. For Gordin, the war itself only undergirded his sense that Jewish election is an election to suffering. He describes here the Jewish people as sowers, that's where it's a part of my title for my book comes from, and picking up on the Lurianic Kabbalistic theme of Tikkun Olam, as well as Hermann Cohen's own teaching, he writes that, quote, only, one can only sow outside that is how the earth is transformed, that it germinates humanity anew. If Israel is the scattered center, if it is everywhere and nowhere, messianic time will fill the world in its entirety. He was thus until his death staunchly anti-Zionist. At the same time, he introduced his young audience to a way of reading that was new to them, one strongly influenced by Judah Halevi and the Maharal of Prague. He taught his students to resist the claim that Greek or scientific knowledge should be the arbiter of sense in treating the biblical text. He reversed the priority and taught that, I'm quoting here from Leon Ashkenazi, who has in many ways filtered our perception of what Jacob Gordon taught. Um, it, was the thought understood to, it was the thought understood to be universal, which in its turn now must be evaluated by the criteria of a Jewish conscience. So Judaism much, must judge what has been deemed universal. As he argued for a historical sensibility unique to Torah, by which its true protagonist was the Jewish people in its past, present, and future. One can only imagine how powerful this message was to the generation of young people that Gordon taught until his death in 1947, a generation dissatisfied with the dominant culture, one they'd understood to have abandoned them. They were hungry for a means to critique it and looking to rediscover themselves as Jews. He introduced to them a lineage of Jewish thinkers who, unlike the 19th century, 19th century pioneers of the Sciences de Judaisme, or the Wissenschaft des Judentums, embraced the particularism of the Jewish people. But at the same time, he was, let me emphasize again, staunchly anti-Zionist. But he died before the birth of the Jewish state. For the generation that followed him, even as they remained loyal to his hermeneutics, Faced with the refugee crisis and the emerging state, his anti-Zionist position quickly became untenable. But finding a way to embrace Zionism that it would at the same time still valorize their own project of reviving French Judaism was more difficult than one might imagine. Throughout Jewish periodicals and conference proceedings from the 1950s, there were expressions of exuberant hope about the state of Israel, what it was to mean for the future of Judaism, but also anxiety and reserve both about the forms of culture emerging in Israel and the role that Israeli cultural emissaries expected to play in the diasporic communities, especially insofar as they came to France to promote the return to the Promised Land. Levinas himself tried out a series of justifications for the state in religious terms, having written in 1939 that it was the pe people Israel's destiny to resist, quote, the cult of power and terrestrial grandeur. In 1948, he writes with regret about the new nation with its Jewish soldiers and Jewish peasants. They're just hungry to start a history. It's too bad. This is what he says in a letter to Maurice Bonchot. Even for Levinas, ultimately, it is only by defending <coughs> Israel's existence in religious terms that he can come to embrace it. By 1951, he was fighting to overcome his own reservations by arguing for the state's world historical significance. 
Judaism has to announce its presence on the plane of objective spirit, he contends. Quote, and what rel relevance the infidelities to Judaism's great teaching for which the state itself could eventually be rendered culpable, and what importance the injury rendered to our fine European sensibility by the violence of its young reality. Real I'm sorry, by the violence of its young reality. Its reality alone counts, he wrote. Today, at least, Israel constitutes the form by which underground Judaism makes its exit toward history. I'm tempted, of course, here to read Levinas as being ironic, but at some point the irony shifts to a validation, so it's sort of hard to track how, at the same time, he can be both ironic and yet use this as a justification for the state of Israel. So once again, there's this kind of tension in his own sentiment. A similar process of conversion marks the transformation of the colloque des intellectuels juifs to other great contributors, both of whom understood themselves as, as, as disciples of Jacob Gordon. But for them, it would be by em embracing an identification with the Israelite of the Torah that they would come to find their way to religious Zionism. For the sake of time, I'm going to focus here on Leon Ashkenazi and mention Neher only briefly. Leon Ashkenazi, an Algerian Jew and scout, who came to France, so this is him as a scout, um, who came to France as a member of a World War II battalion, was Gordin's successor at Robert Gamzon's school. And he would credit Gordin as his master until the end. Though virtually unknown in the United States, he's widely influential in France and continues to be so in Israel among the Francophone Jewish community. Until the mid-1950s, he followed Gordin in arguing for the importance of the diaspora as the future of Jewish spiritual life. If Israel is to be the physical homeland, Ashkenazi writes in the early 1950s, the diaspora will have to serve as its spiritual center. In an essay from 1954, he describes the diaspora as the source of Judaism's saving power. The Israelis will reap the joys of nationhood, while those in exile toil for world salvation, he suggested. But that all changed. In 1956, on a trip to Israel, he attended the seminar of Rav Svi Yehuda Cook, the son of Abraham Isaac Cook the inspiration for Gush Emunim, and came to the conclusion that Cook's thinking was the logical conclusion of Gordan's. Gordan, he said, would have become a Zionist had he met Cook, Ashkenazi argued. Briefly, it's important to remember that Rav Svi Cook was the facilitator of religious Zionism as a political program. While Rav Cook the Elder was the inspiration for religious Zionism, Rav Cook the Younger was the inspiration for the post-67 settlers movement. While Rav Cook the Elder made the radical move of interpreting Zionist activity as a stage in messianic redemption, of seeing the secular pioneers as unwitting but necessary tools in the Jewish people's redemptive narrative, the reality of redemption always remained in the future for him, thus allowing a gap between the ideal and the real to remain intact. Rav Cook the Younger closed that gap, arguing that, quote, the master of the universe has his own political agenda, according to which politics here below are conducted. Part of this redemption is the conquest and settlement of the land. This is dictated by divine politics, and no earthly politics can supersede it. In a religious variation on the Hegelian theme of the cunning of reason, Cook argued that the military and political power of the state of Israel were unwitting partners in the enactment of God's will. As Avieza Ravitsky describes it, the payoff of the younger Cook's method is that religious faith comes to sanctify the socio-political structure, transferring it to the realm of the absolute, and thereby bestowing upon it a transcendent validity. Israel's wars then, quote, come to be seen not merely in terms of national survival or reclamation of ancestral lands. They are portrayed in ethical and theological terms as a mighty struggle to uproot evil and achieve universal rectification. And it is exactly in these terms that Ashkenazi and Neher and their followers would come to embrace Zionism and to give up on the project of French Judaism, or at least to see its function as auxiliary to the Zionist project. For Ashkenazi, Cook explicitly provided the theological means to find in the state of Israel the agent of both temporal and spiritual messianic redemption. Furthermore, Cook's method of scriptural hermeneutics harmonized with Gordin's historiosophical method the method by which one reads the Tanakh as providing insight into history, and history itself as providing insight into the text. Ashkenazi took away from Cook that the age of Geula, of deliverance, which for Gordin remained futural, was imminent. For Ashkenazi, this interpretation does not suspend Jewish universalism. It gives it a concrete fulfillment. Gordin had himself contended, following Judah HaLevi, that the Jewish people are at the center of universal sacred history. But this had provided a means for him to justify Jewish suffering and exile. In Ashkenazi's hands, this interpretation became a mean to read, means to read Cook as the next inheritor of Gordin's own line of thought, one that he traces from Halevi through the Maharal of Prague to Cook. 
for each Jewish exceptionalism is Jewish universalism. There is thus ironically a claim to continuity here within the tradition of French Judaism's universalism, even as its hermeneutic has been reversed. I quote from Ashkenazi, Israel assumes the history of the entire universe because Israel, from Abraham, is capable of divining and knowing the creator's project, and it is Israel that assumes everywhere the condition of the uh, exile of holiness, and it is Israel that carries the hope and the demand of deliverance from this exile of sanctity. Jews are exceptional, according to this narrative, because by way of the Torah, they have given, been given the tool to interpret God's word. They are the object of God's punishment, consequently, because with the capacity to receive God's word comes also the capacity not to heed it. But now the time of deliverance has arrived, according to Ashkenazi, affirming Rav Cook's teaching. It is a time comparable to Moses's, when the Israelites did not have the confidence to leave exile. Like the slaves in Egypt, Jews who remain in the diaspora are unwilling to believe that the stage of exile has passed. This is not a sign of crisis of faith, it is a resistance to recognizing the new age. Ashkenazi even insisted that this new way of thinking did not amount to nationalism. Because of their election to suffering, the Jews, he argued, can never embody a chauvinism. They are a people at the heart of the world. This people exists for the sake of others, for the nations of the world, not in conflict with them. Ironically, thus, we have a confluence of all the trends of French Judaism expressed as an ethnic nationalism, but which will never be identified as such by its practitioners. This is perhaps nowhere clearer than in the words of André Neher, who helped originate the Colloque des Intellectuels Juifs de l'Enfant Française in the 1950s and 60s, who led the Strasbourg Jewish community for decades, who provided an outline for the new form of the French Jewish intellectual, who insisted that what united modern Jews throughout all its myriad forms was its linking of Judaism to the universal. In one of his last presentations to the French Jewish community, but for the General Assembly of French Judaism in Paris, he expressed his regret at having come to devote himself so late to the Zionist cause. But he did so by arguing that, through, that though Zionism risked, quote, reducing the Jewish people to a dangerously narrow particularism, God's election of this people, their endless trials for the sake of the world, transformed its mission into the most universalist of aims. Quote, yesterday I pursued with humanity the fight of men for this no most noble of human values, for truth, for peace, for justice. Today I pursue only the fight for Israel, for it gathers in all the others, sums them up, and above all, plunges them into a crucible of a decisive test. The fight for Israel was a metaphysical battle to reunite the navel of the universe with its chosen bride. We can see here thus the amalgamation of French, the French emphasis on universalism, the definition of the tradition in confessional terms, the wartime emphasis on suffering as a means of Jewish identification, all of which are understood to be part of an ongoing narrative which justifies in religious terms the Jewish conquering of Palestine. In conclusion, I want to add that this is, of course, not, this is of course only one avenue that this story could pursue. There are others, and there are others who stood by the diasporic ideal and those who supported Israel but resisted the logic of religious Zionism. Levinas himself would insist that the prophetic tradition had to serve as a check on the worldly ambitions of the state rather than as a justification for its actions. But he argued that it is because the Jewish people have the sacred law that they will build a nation more righteous than others. Thus even he could never fully resist the temptation to set its drama apart and thus to set the suffering of its people apart from the suffering of other nations, particularly those with which it was in conflict. Both Israel the people and Israel the nation could only and would only ever be, I'm quoting from a 1981 essay, the most fragile, the most vulnerable thing in the world. I think I have, is it really? No, I don't, okay. Um, however strong it became, it would, I quote again, carry pain and dereliction in its depth. He writes this describing it as a, at moments with the very terms he used to describe the imprisonment of the Jewish soldier, this language of carrying pain and dereliction. By virtue of this, he would insist Whatever the political realities appear to be on the ground, to act for Israel would be to act for the very idea of peace. Thank you. Happy to take questions. 
can Ms. Rafi, the, the uh, when did that community yeah. when did they come into the story? Yeah, so I mean it's interesting, the scouts actually are a means by which a number of North African Jews come before the Algerian War. So, so you know, the late 1950s, early 60s, the years of the Algerian War are of course a time of a great influx. Um, but one of the interesting things about the scout movement, so the figures that I'm particularly following here, is that they had cultivated a scout movement in North Africa. Ed had Levinas. Levinas had by way of the school that he ran. So there are figures who are very important to this movement who are North African, including Ashkenazi, um, but would I say that they represent something like the normative strain of the North African tradition? No. Um, and of course there's another story to be told here too, which is about the way in which France moves to the right religiously, or French Jews move to the right by way of the influx of that community. Um, but what's interesting is that I think even for that community, these figures that I follow remain the intellectual leaders. Um, I mean, even for somebody like Shmuel Trigano, who is very influential, these are the people that he too recognizes as being the kind of intellectual core of French, of post-war French Judaism. What about Derrida? So Derrida is a very interesting part of the story, um, and I tell this little anecdote in my um, second book. Um, he only went to the colloque because Levinas kind of dragged him there. Um, and um, there's this moment in which he's there and Levinas kind of like signals his distance from these guys. Um, and then after Levinas dies, he goes back in 1998 and gives this sort of tribute to Levinas, but he introduces the tribute by pointing out that Levinas' biographer had said that of the French Jews who would go to the colloque, one would never see their Jacques Derrida. And of course, Derrida loves this because of course he had been there. So um, yeah, I think, I mean, Derrida makes, I mean, there's all these sideline comments in his work in which he like makes a point of distancing himself from this community very clearly. Charlie? I'm trying to get my head around the, the universalism yeah, yeah. Of the, of the, that, that's being articulated here by way of Jewish election exemplarity. Because um, I feel like I'm missing something. Uh -huh. um, at the end there, it's th these, uh, these figures who make the turn seem to be suggesting that somehow Zionism will promote truth, peace, and justice. Mm -hmm. And in, so that reminded me of a point you made earlier in your talk about how these 19th century French Jews understood Judaism as actually carrying forward Republican values. Right. Um, but here it obviously has a different valence. But it's a uni is it, so it seems, first of all, a universalism of values. Or, um, but so maybe that's wrong, but that's what I'm asking for. Yeah, yeah. With. But also, how do they understand the kind of mechanism of this yeah. universalism? Like, what, what is, how, how exactly <laughs> is Zionism supposed right. to be I mean, look, distributing I'm these? I'm not going to tell you I'm not puzzled by this too, because it is, it's, it's, I mean, in places it's, I mean, in Andre Neher's work, for example, and in Ashkenazi's, it seems it's metaphysical. Um, so like, um, Andre Neher writes this book in the 1970s in which he describes the sort of story of the Jewish people as this sort of trinity of forces, the Jewish people, God, and the land. And, the, and, and in this itself is a sort of retelling of Judah HaLevi, um, but so, because this is now the time of, and so there's been this metaphysical brokenness in, this, in the world and so far as Jews have been separated from the land. So the return of the Jews to the land is cosmic significance. It heals the world. Um, so what's interesting about it is that on the one hand, there's that sort of mythic story being told, but there's a borrowing of some of the language that seems to harken back to 19th century Judaism. Um, and the insistence, a very defensive insistence, and I have, you know, encounter this in interviews sometimes with you know, people who, associate themselves with the movement, that when you say, like, right, but this is so nationalistic, they say, no, 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 it's not nationalistic, no, it's not. This is, he was, Ashkenazi always insisted he was a universalist first. Um, so there's a kind of a, a desire to hold on to that language. Does it always make sense in rational terms? I can't say that I think that it always does, except that at the same time that this argument's being made, there's this other argument being made about the West and philosophy, and the philosophy as a, as a broken universalism. And why is it a broken universalism? Because philosophy, Ashkenazi says, asks questions. It doesn't have answers, it just asks questions. Prophecy is the opposite. Prophecy is God speaking. 
So in fact, the right source for this universalism is, can only be found within the Jewish tradition because what you have on the other side is cultures who have only been able to ask and have, don't really have the right mechanism of connection. Just one quick remark on yeah. that that echoes early Christian mm -hmm. critiques of philosophy sure. and, and Christian universalism as the finally delivered answer. Yeah, to right, yeah. makes sense. Um, Amy, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, I was just curious whether, I mean, it's, it's on the same question, and, and, and you talk about us having this metaphysical view that when the Jews get returned to the land, it's something cosmically is healed. I mean, do they tell, does he or others, I mean, I this money, but do they tell a story about what yeah. the effects of that cosmic healing are going to be? In vague terms. Um, I mean, it's, you know, the promise still remains a promise. I mean, but you see this even now, right, if you, like, go to the, um, the Temple Institute in Jerusalem, um, you know, the, 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 because there's always this incremental distance between the actual healing of the universe, right? And, you know, even if it's the building of the Third Temple, there's always the promise that when, I mean, you know, and so if you, there's this, um, this video that they show in the Temple Institute in which they actually show the sort of computer program image of the temple already built and everybody in, I th guess they're in Jerusalem, they stop what they're doing and they all turn and they'll look at the temple and they, 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 the kids are playing ball and the man is reading the newspaper and, and they see, and you don't see what they see, but you see that the moment is being stipulated just in the distance. And everything looks the same. Everything looks the way it does now. Everything looks like you know our own modern time. But there's this moment, and it's going to come, and, and the children are going to be the witness. So is there the sense that even for somebody like Ashkenazi, of course, there's, there's still in this moment in which the, the, the fulfillment has not yet mm -hmm. occurred. Um, and part of that is, and part of the, the resistance to the fulfillment is that there's so many Jews who don't recognize, right, that this is the moment of deliverance, and they need to recognize that they are in the moment of deliverance, and they're resisting and they're holding back. The so the refusal of the Zionist project is keeps that resolution from ever, from from ever yet occur. Yeah, I mean, and this is also, of course, the, the, I mean, that sort of the the difficulty of in religious Zionism over what's the Messiah and what's Israel, right? Yeah. And it's like, and where do you differentiate the mechanism of the Messiah? And where do you, where do you, where is the actual making of the state itself fulfilling that messianic work? And it's a messy thing to try to find the sort of point of differentiation. Yeah, please go ahead. Sorry. I suppose it would have come up in the last two questions, but just to make sure, there's no explicit engagement, critical or otherwise, with Republican ideals by these figures who have sort of. No, there, I mean, there is and there, there is. First of all, there is the sense among a number of them that the old version of the federation between Jews and the state of, uh, the state of France is a broken form, right? That that, and so Ashkenazi is explicit about the fact that modern Jewish thought is not really Jewish thought. And Mendelssohn is not Jewish thought. Anyone who comes after is not Jewish thought because they're too... Um, too subservient to the ideals of the West. Um, but at the same time, I mean, that's what's interesting about the universalism. I mean, and yet there is this, yes, there's, there's this claim, and part of this, I think, has to do with the continued reading of Judaism in religious terms, in confessional terms. There is still the desire to hold on to what I think was the clearest mark of that pre-war Judaism, which is this claim that Judaism is a universalism. And then there, too, in the pre-war French Judaism, there's still a kind of logic of exemplarity. I mean, even in the work of the Alliance Credit Universelle, right, the, like the, there's this sense in which Jews have to demonstrate these principles, and they will be the community that will demonstrate them. And you see that in Hermann Cohen, too, right, that like that's what the Jews have to do. They have to exemplify what it means to live without the happiness of nationhood. Um, so there are consonances. Yeah, please. Um, th thank you very much. Uh, two small questions and a, a very small remark. One is, um, I'm thinking in already in 1936, uh, Levinas, when he reviews uh, Shmuel Hugo Bergman's book written in Hebrew, yeah, um, he's raveling about the 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 meeting, the reuniting of, of Hebrew and philosophy. And, and so it seems that, s at least to some extent, 
some of these people were grappling with oh how yeah. are they to be exactly. Jews. Yeah. And, 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 and how much do you see this Judaism reborn from the ruins of war as a, a moment of um, a myth making mm -hmm. of, of, of which has a, a very a major force uh, that can be operative in telling the story of Judaism, but they were looking for a story uh, yeah. to some extent. No, that's a nice point. And, and, and so this is uh, 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 one question. The other, there is a preface written by Emmanuel Levinas on Jacob Goldin yep. on 51, wi yep. which may be an interest play, interesting place yeah. play for, for yeah. the relationship. Yeah. And the last one, I, I was wondering what, in comparison to Truth for Children, um, what would you say about the 57 essay of, of religion for adults? Oh, yeah. And uh, how much... It's a nice comparison, yeah. Yeah, this, yeah. this truth for, ch for children is maybe something of a childish, childish phase. But I think he did think that. I think Levinas did think that. And so and he's certainly an outlier here, right? And so what's interesting is that this essay is written in 45, and he never published it. Um, so it was found in his papers. Um, and you're right. I mean, in the, I mean then that, that contrast is important, that he certainly... He sees it as a passing moment, and it doesn't represent what you see of his thinking about what Judaism will represent I mean in the post-war world. To overcome, right? I think it is something to overcome, and yet it is a moment that he felt, and he expresses how that he felt it in the moment, and yet it, and it's taken up by a different stream, one which he had great contempt for. He would not want to be in the same talk as Ashkenazi and Neher. I mean, Neher maybe more so. I mean, he seemed to show more respect for Neher, but he did not show much respect for Leon Ashkenazi. He hated the scouting movement. Um, now, you know, there are people like, um, David Hansel, who's his um, son-in-law, who are very interested in finding the symmetry between Ashkenazi and Levinas and arguing that they are agree on much more than Levinas may have thought that they agreed on. And I think that's at the center of a whole major debate over the legacy of Levinas. My interest in putting them together is to show that even as Levinas tried to pull himself and rejected many of the tenets of this tradition, he, there are impulses in his own work which nonetheless share its logic. And I think that's important to see. Um, thanks. Um, I, I was wondering what kind of range of engagements or dialogues you see people um, in these lines of thoughts having with those uh, immigrants who are supporting Algerian struggles for independence? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, so the story of the movements that, so Robert Gamzon school, Robert Gamzon starts this school. He gets all this money from the Joint Distribution Committee in the States to start the school. It's in this beautiful um, house in the suburbs of, of Paris. Um, and he leaves in 49 to start his own kibbutz, which fails, and he ends up working at the Weizmann Institute. That school gets ultimately led by Ashkenazi. Um, and this is one of these things that I have trouble piecing together because people don't actually want to talk about what happened as the school fell apart. It fell apart by 69, really. Um, there were a whole succession of <coughs> leaders, um, some of which who do not share Ashkenazi's politics at all, but many of them say that the battle that ultimately broke them up was over the Algerian war, partially because at this point there are a number of Algerian Jews who are part of this movement, and some of those really want to identify with the Arab cause. Ashkenazi does not. Um, he is starkly on the side of France in the war. Um, and that seems to have been a real point of contention. So I'm wondering about the, uh, the relationship between three different modes of discourse that you highlight. Um, one is this turn to the literal, the sort of rekindling of um, biblical or medical literalism. The second is this uh, revival of religious or confessional language. And the third is perhaps a political theological defense of Zionism. And so I'm just trying to map that relationship in my mind. I'm curious if you could maybe just reflect on the ways they overlap, the ways they're different, and the ways they reinforce one another. Yeah, thank you. Let's clarify the stakes of my talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so depending on which talk I'm giving, it depends on which of these I emphasize the most. Um, I think the real question, the real question behind your question is, in other words, is like, what's the source and what's the effect, right? Um, and in some sense here, I'm trying to say that, there, that the 
that the way in which, and I don't know if like you put, if you really put me in a corner whether I'd back this up, but I, I do in fact, I think at this moment, hold to it, um, that the experience of being able to feel that what I'm calling biblical literalism, which you may have some beef with that too, because what I mean by that is the sort of sense that it's not just reading the text for what's on the surface, it's experiencing the text as true, not only its historical sense, but true for these individuals at that very moment. Um, that they are living its historical drama, right? I think that that capacity to have that kind of experience, I have trouble making sense of it when we're just talking about post-war religious Zionism. I have trouble understanding how it's possible to embody that narrative. I don't have trouble understanding how it's possible to embody that narrative during the war. And so when I say it's a consequence of having so profoundly felt oneself at the center of a cosmic battle that allows one 20 years later to continue to see oneself at the center of, at center of a cosmic value, then I see how the pieces fit together. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask about um, a term that you had mentioned a few times, which is the, which relates to t a certain kind of temporality um, that uh, is embodied in the post-war context, which is the term of like the remnant, the the figure, or the community that remains. Yeah. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's a, a certain way that you think that that temporality is inflecting the way that universalism is construed in this context. That is oh, that that's that a really like good question. There's a certain kind of universalism that obtains for those who are in this situation of remaining, who are the remaining. Right. That makes me think I need to think about Paul. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, um, yeah, I haven't given that enough thought, but I think it's a really good insight um, that, the, that the way in which this begins to become a messianism is tied to, to the language of being a remnant. The problem with that, I think, is that that experience of being a remnant is so profound in these moments at the end of the war. And I wonder, I mean, it's, it's certainly not the case, that because then by the time they're trying to find a way of fitting into Zionism, I don't think they any longer are embodying that sensibility. By that time, there, there was this period of 10 to 15 years in which they're really invested in saying, no, we can have a French Judaism. Um, and it can be a French Judaism that resists the sort of the, it can be an a, a alternative voice in contemporary issues is one of the ways they think about it. Um, and so their rhetoric has changed. So the question is how can you tie that experience of being a remnant, which is very key in that period during the war, to the way in which they take on this messianism? And I don't know the answer to that, but it's a great question. Um, this is kind of a half-formed question, so I'll have to bear with me. But um, one wrinkle in the talk I found interesting was, and I can't remember exactly what, what context was, but I, I believe you said that um, some of these figures felt, right after the fall of France, a, a sense of sort of incredulity at the fact that they were living at such a sort of obviously world historical and most mythic moment. Um, and then later in the talk, you said, um, I believe, that, um, or later in the talk, you've you mentioned several times this idea that, um, particularly with Levinas, there was, there's, it's hard to tell sometimes whether he's being ironic or um, yeah. serious in his engagement with this biblical literalism <coughs> that leads to a kind of Zionism. Um, and, and I got the sense when you made that comment that perhaps the irony is connected to. Um, Levinas's sort of amusement at the fact that he's um, drawn to, to this view at that moment. I think that's um, right, yeah. And so, so those elements struck, um, jumped out to me. And then in the question period, you asked, or someone asked a question, and you said, well, um, uh, Levinas ultimately departs from this view. Um, and there are people like Ashkenazi who continue to embody it, but Levinas like him and, and moves away from um, this perspective. Could you say a little more about what's going on or what you intended 
in, in sort of noting the incredulity of these figures, these moments of irony. There was also, you said something about how the, there's a moment in which you can sort of see the old yeah, sort the of scientific, yeah. Universalist, universalist. What's going on there? Is a little more you can say about Okay, that. so I, I mean, I, I found myself emphasizing that in this talk partially because I realized that that is kind of what fascinates me about how it's possible to embrace this literalism while at the same time having been trained as rationalists, having been trained by universities, which all of these figures had been. Um, and I don't, I mean, I wish I hadn't, I mean, I don't understand it yet, and I don't know if I will understand it, but I think it's important to me to point it out because oftentimes when we think about a kind of biblical literalism um, or that kind of hermeneutic with the bi of the Bible, we treat it as simplistic. And we assume that the people who espouse it are simple-minded. These are not people who are simple-minded. Um, these are people who incredibly sophisticated thinkers. And so there's something willful in their taking it on. And I am fascinated by what it takes to take that on. Because the voices of rationalism, I think they're still there. And I think they still appear. And I don't, I'm fascinated by this movement partially because I don't understand what that's like. I don't understand how that works. Um, thank you so much. This has been really amazing. Um, I guess I was curious during the course of your talk about how this work might relate to our contemporary moment. Um, and so the things that sort of jumped to mind were um, Canary Mission. And I know that they've sort of targeted some University of Chicago areas as well as the I don't term. know what that is. I'm oh, okay, so it's um, an organization that targeted students they saw as um, like putting forward anti-Israeli ideas. Oh, okay. um, and so they've like published students' addresses and um, personal information. Um, alongside, and so there's sort of like that, that thing that's been happening on, on college campuses today, as well as a turn in some Jewish intellectual thought towards more direct conversations about Israel, about the state of Israel, thinking of Sarah Shulman and Judith Butler in particular. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you saw sort of some of the rhetorical strategies operating uh, in the field that you're studying still at work, if you see some of this sort of like at odds, or sort of like what we could learn from this conversation about what's happening today. Again, another <laughs> great question. question. <laughs> I don't know if I have a good answer. I mean, I think what I can more modestly say is that the contemporary relevance of the project for me has been, in some sense, anecdotal. It's been the experience of the time I've spent in Israel in the last 10 years, realizing how incredibly robust the Jewish community, I mean, the French community is there. Um, and the sort of the general sensibility of everyone I know that they represent, indeed, the most conservative strand of religious Zionism. And one answer to that is, oh, it's because it's the sort of North African influence. It's the Mizrahi Jewish community. But I guess my interest is in saying like, okay, but there's a kind of theological story that has really invested this community. How does that map onto the American scene? I mean, I'm, I don't know that I'm willing to say. I think it's a very different story. I'm not an expert on this, but, but my sense, and this is totally anecdotal, is that the kind of def enormous defensiveness around the state of Israel among certain American Jews is tied to the sense that it's what they had left, in a sense. It's, um, I mean, there's been, and I mean, I grew up with this as a Reformed Jew, this sort of the mapping of a kind of ancestral attachment to the state of Israel in this totally fully formed way, such that expressing one's Jewish identity was had to be so closely aligned to feeling a sense of allegiance with the state of Israel. Um, that the Jewish community in America is starting to break that apart, but it's a very painful process. Thank you. Um, in the back, how many more questions do you want me to take? As you wish, maybe, maybe just three minutes more, so we should be a little brief. Okay. There's one more question on, on universality and exemplarity. So you had said in regard to the 19th century figures that this um, sort of universality involved an exemplarity for the Catholic community and specifically how to how to read texts. Mm, um, yeah. 
And I wonder, first of all, what that meant for the, that what that the imagination of the Catholic transformation would have looked like. Yeah. How that's oh, supposed it's to affect that community. Yeah. And then in the post-war thinkers, how the sort of metaphysical uh, universality, like. How, what implications that would have for the uh, Christian community, for the Christian, and perhaps also more problematically for an Islamic community as well. Yeah. What's the, you know, is this a sort of still an exemplarity that's being implied, or is there something else going on? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, okay, let me speak to the first part. Um, so, the claim in um, uh, Darmistiti's book. Um, is so he's an interesting figure, one I really only encountered because I'm editing this anthology of French Jewish thought, and um, he really didn't identify as a Jew, um, and he came to identify as a Jew late, and then became fascinated by what he saw really is wrong with French Catholicism. Um, that he saw there's a sort of divide between French Catholicism as a kind of deadening tradition and a scientific reasoning on the other hand. And he saw the prophets as this kind of wonderful in-between space in which you could be, you know, could become the foundation for a kind of, um, you know, ethical monotheism of a sort. So, you know, he's a person of his era in that sense. Um, so his claim is that we need to be reading the prophets right now. And so he writes this book about the prophets, and the audience is clearly the sort of French Catholic community, because he claims that sort of the revival of French Catholicism will involve this return to the prophets. But it, within that claim is the claim that like those of you who think that the Jewish community is a problem, and you say, OK, but we can take their text and not the people, the importance of this people is that they have they have been the carriers of this tradition. You know, and Levinas says basically the same thing um, in his postal writings. I mean, he says that the Jewish people have essentially existed as the carriers of this tradition, of this message. So there are ways in which Levinas looks a lot more like those thinkers than some of the other people I'm talking about. Um, OK. Um, how do they speak to the Christian community? I don't yet have a good answer to that. Um, there's a lot of criticism of more of the sort of the way in which Christianity has been influenced. I mean, the philosophy is the bigger target for Ashkenazi. Um, but I think there's this, I mean, this Charlie, as my, I was rereading my talk today and I was thinking about what we were talking about at lunch in terms of the Abrahamic. There is this claim, I think, for Neher in particular, that the Jews are the, they, they safeguard the Abrahamic tradition. And they are the ones who have the, the claim to be at the center of it. And so they are necessary and important for the other Abrahamic faiths, as, as, as literally as, as a sort of genetic and metaphysical center to what they are also the peripheral carriers of. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. But. Sarah, I'm going to suggest yeah. that we let you take questions informally, um, and we can also stand up and stretch. There may be some le refreshments left over in the back. Feel free to help yourself. But um, let's thank Sarah again.